Tapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Polo Reef, Champion Lighting and Supply, and GHL. Hey, what's happening, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of Rapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Herkelhammer. So today on the live stream, I welcome back Tim Kelly, who owns Purple Monster Corals, which is a coral export business in the Solomon Islands. What's going on there, Tim? Hey, happy uh, well, it's Wednesday here. Yeah, what time of the day is it? It's so, the next day. It's like ten oh three in the morning on Wednesday. All right, so it's like it's a reasonable hour for you. I've had uh, some guests from yeah. uh, from Germany that uh, you know have to be on at like a one o'clock their time to uh, to do the live stream. Yeah, which I might very much appreciate. Yep. So I, uh, I I appreciate you, uh, man, taking the time again to uh, to be on the live stream to yeah. chat. Yeah, um, you know, you're, uh, you're, you're doing it this time from your facility, which is going to be pretty cool because you're going to, uh, give us a little, uh, tour once we, um, get into the media discussion of the facility and, and show us some of the, uh, the corals that, that you have in that holding facility. But, um, before we start chatting there, Tim, I want to take care of some business and thank the sponsors of this of show. Uh, the sponsors are really important to me. They make the show possible with their support, and that means a lot since I want to continue to bring on awesome guests to help foster a learning environment on the show. Polar Reef is one sponsor. Make sure to check out Polar Reef's new YouTube video that drops this Friday. The Polar Reef team gives us a behind-the-scenes tour of Fitz Fish Ponds, that's a tongue twister, in New Jersey, where some of the most spectacular Japanese koi are imported the journey includes the arrival of some of Polar Reef's prized fish, including Jennifer Aniston, who won grand champion in Polar Reef's um, video last week. Make sure to subscribe to their YouTube channel at Polar Reef for the video drop notifications. I, I had a picture of Jennifer Aniston uh, last week. Tim, I don't have the picture uh, again on this uh, stream, but it was quite striking, I guess, just uh, similar to the actress. A named koi yeah. fish? Uh, I didn't know I didn't know you named koi koi fish, but uh, makes sense to me. Uh, another it's like race yeah, uh, champion lighting and supply. Appreciate their support. Uh, besides being a place for hobbyists to purchase saltwater aquarium supplies online, Champion Lighting is also a wholesale distributor for many popular brands. If you own an aquarium store or an aquarium service company, contact Champion Lighting through their website at championlighting.com to set up a wholesale account. My third sponsor is GHL. Personally, I'm all in on using GHL products. I have a lot of success using their dosers, their Profilux controllers, the Mitra's lights, the cage director, et cetera. They produce high quality German engineered products. All right, and with all that out of the way, let's, uh, let's talk reef, man. Um, so Tim, sure. the last time I had you on in November, we uh, mm -hmm. we had a great talk, but can you refresh people's memory in case they don't recall that uh, conversation in terms of what Purple Monster Corals is all about? Sure, sure. So we are a uh, small sort of artisanal coral export uh, business. We do quite a bit of uh, coral farming, propagating with local villages. Uh, the whole point is to sort of develop the Solomons as a as an exporting country uh, for aquarium fish and, and corals. We don't do fish yet. But, uh, you know, it's, it's on the radar. Um, but to, you know, hire locals and to use local materials and to develop you know, Solomon, Solomon aquatic exports. Um, it's got a long history. There's been uh, something like um, uh, 1991, 1992, I think was the original uh, exports coming out of the Solomons. And so we're, we're sort of pulling on that legacy to, uh, to grow here. How? Um, go ahead. No, no I, I was just going to ask you in terms of what kind of um, how's the, the volume been over the last, um, you know, since you started exporting corals? I mean, a, a, as a, as the volume of exports for you increased, remained about the same. What do you think the future holds in terms of that stuff? It's remained about the same. We've we've got uh, a whole lot of potential built up sort of potential energy on farming uh, that hasn't been tapped yet. We I. Uh, we had Jake come out in 2019, in March of 2019, he came out and uh, we sort of kickstarted coral farming. And that was right in time to get them ready to export as COVID developed a year later. Yeah. So uh, that put a wet blanket over the whole thing. Um, so 
you know, rebuilding that um, and then looking at other locations, looking in, you know, just locations outside of this island. Um, but yeah, so as far as coral farming goes, the potential is, is sort of staggering. Uh, but with the coral exports as it is, we're about the same as we were last year. Um, you know, 20 to 25 box shipments, things like that every week to two weeks. It's not, it's not massive. It's, it's, you know, artisanal scale. It's not, it's not industrial. Is, is that just because of the, um, the challenges you face in terms of being able to collect at a larger scale or is it uh, government restrictions or is it just demand on the, um, no, on volume? Volume wise, it's not a government restriction. Um, there are some, you know, being a developing country, uh, there's a lot of yeah, potholes in the road, mm. is maybe the best way to put it. There's a lot of failure points um, in the chain of custody. I mean, to get a to get an export out, I have to have, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fisheries license. And then after a fisheries license, that should be a year and a half to get in the first place. After fisheries license, it's CITES permit for the export. One missed email can push that back a week or yeah. two because uh, you have windows to export. Mm -hmm. And then after you've landed that, then it's the airlines. Anyone there cannot answer an email or a phone call. And that kicks it another week. Uh, once the airlines is lined up, then the airlines has to communicate because we're transiting through Fiji. If Fiji is difficult, that can create, you know, so there's so many failure points that we take for granted in more developed countries, you know, say Australia or even Indonesia. Indonesia is like six most developed country in the world. Um, it's, it, or six highest GDP, something like that. Anyways, it's a pretty, pretty darn developed. So compared to those countries, uh, it's tough. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot of places where people can drop the ball and there's not a whole lot of consequences for dropping the ball. There's for me, I mean, that's a missed whole week of business loss, right? right. But for the, the, the people that I need to interface with, uh, yeah, there's, there's failure points for sure. Right. I remember your last conversation, you were talking about how the internet was, um, you know, not the most reliable type of uh, service out no. there. I can even imagine like sending emails to these people that you're waiting responses on and like that stuff falling potentially in spam folders. I'm assuming there's spam folders out there that, um, yep. so. Yep. It's, you have to follow up. People don't, I mean, again, like I grew up with the internet, right? Like, you know, I'm born in 84, uh, but like I grew up with the internet by like what sixth grade, we were learning to make websites in public school, right? Like here, a lot of people, like they don't have an email account that's stable. And, and so like just managing like, oh, new contact, put it in the folder, send a handshake email to make sure it doesn't get sent to the spam folder. Those aren't customs that people have here. Um, so yeah, yeah, things get lost. Uh, also, you know, interfacing with a village. I mean, just trying to keep a cell phone charged when you're out of town. Like once you leave town boundaries, you're 50 years in the past. So <laughs> power is, is you're like, screwed. you know, they've got, maybe, yeah, they've got maybe one fifty solar watt panel for the whole village. Oh. And that'll, that'll charge up a, a little like motorcycle battery. And then from that motorcycle battery, they'll charge their cell phones. But you know, if it's a cloudy day or if someone forgot to connect it, or if someone got a little greedy and took too much power, the person you're trying to reach might just not be able to charge their cell phone for a day or two or three. <laughs> it's just how it is. So, and cell phone towers go down. Yeah. It's, it's goofy. Things happen. Um, let's see here. Uh, see some familiar faces in the chat here. Well, great beard or reef, the moderator. What's happening there? Paul, Brandon, Scott, Art. What's happening? Uh, Alex Correa from Hawaii. ACI. Chris Meckley's in the house there. What's going on there, okay. uh, Chris? A um, couple of uh, other comments. But um, so, <clears throat> all right. What about the, uh, so no, no additional um, red tape issues in terms of uh, dealing with the government for exporting purposes. That's kind of... Um, Pretty much, you got you got the same sort of thing hurdles that you got to deal with on, on the government side of things over there. Yeah, I mean, there's always some, and we're dealing with a with a you know all corals and endangered species, so it you know you have to deal with CITES paperwork, and that creates its own you know overlay of complications. But we navigate it; we're we're pretty comfortable navigating it now. Um, there was definitely some hair pulling moments at first, but we're we're five years in, so yeah, it's it's we've we've got that aspect figured out. So it's an election year, so it's always fun here for elections so anybody yeah. you're lobbying for to uh to win the election no i stay out, <laughs> I stay out of politics as best as i can uh yeah. all right a couple of questions here so chris is wondering um are you seeing any bleaching on solomon reefs any bleaching events i for the first time am seeing bleaching on a reef that i like to collect mm. on a and i'm seeing crown of thorn stars on that same reef that so sucks. it's getting it's getting hit hard yeah 
Um, so yeah, uh, this is coastal coastal Guadalcanal. I'm seeing bleaching and crown of thorns. What um, I mean, so are crown of thorns kind of uh, opportunistic in that sense? When when corals are in distress, they'll try to somehow uh, you know gravitate My there. My understanding is that... it's, it's more like a locust thing. So they they'll have a boom of population where they'll they'll just go crazy, and it'll be like every you know three feet there's a crown of thorn star, and they're everywhere. And I'm seeing them small right now. You know they get they get massive. Um, but so they, they boom. And then I think that they wipe out some reefs and then they start to death and then they have a bunch of babies and a couple years later that pop. So I think it's like a, you know, kind of like a sine wave of population, um, just like with locusts. So they, they go crazy, they eat up crops and then they disappear for a couple of years and then they come back real bad. Um, there's been a lot of thought that like, it's, it's from shell collection, the big Triton shells, mm -hmm. uh, those Triton conks or Triton whelks that they eat them. I don't see a whole lot of that collection going on here you know, like tourism curio stuff, but, um, yeah, yeah. It's, I think, I think it's just a, a natural phenomenon that every couple of years you get these booms in, uh, in crown thorn stars, but they're nasty. I mean, I don't know if you've ever gotten, gotten stabbed by yeah. one, but um, I try to, whenever I see them, perforate them, drop a rock on them, but they, um, the spikes that are all over them, they're, they create this really bad throbbing pain if you get jabbed by them. So, it, yeah. so is that a thing? Like I know in, in the keys, I think it is off of Florida, they, um, you know, you can, you can hunt, uh, lionfish, right. Is that, right. Uh, is that a thing yeah, in terms of crown of reef, thorns uh, there? There are reef restoration uh, operations or like, I was talking with the, uh, the operator for Billy Kiki, a really, pretty, really famous dive operation here. Um, they will, when they don't have booked up schedules, like if they've got a couple days free, they'll go around with syringes and they inject them with like, I think it's basically calcosser. Um, they inject them with that and that kills them. Um, I unfortunately just don't have the time or means to be doing it, but I'd like to have that point where like, yeah, two days a month or three days a month, we just go out and zap crown of thorns. That's, you know, that's a doable thing. Yeah. But man, that's gotta be a daunting task. So, I mean, you know, that, that that's the wild and, and they're, uh, you know, and part of the, uh, part of the food chain, so to speak there. Right. And, and it's kind of, it's a pest and, um, you know, pests are part of, uh, reefs in, in the wild and part of reefs in, in the, um, you know, in, at home. So. Yeah. Yeah. And a major studies have been like throughout Australia, they do a lot of, you know, studies in Great Barrier Reef of these populations. And it seems like not a whole lot of like positive, like they don't know exactly what the cause is. They don't know exactly the best way to get rid of them or to manage them. Or if management is really what's needed, if it just sort of plays it's it plays the cycle out and then 10 years later or eight years later whatever their cycle is they come back again but um the reefs you know reefs have been around for at least um you know corals as we know them reefs of something like 70 or 80 million years um but reefs have been around for hundreds of millions of years so they'll they'll survive this this too will pass i, I see there's some conversation in the chat about uh asternia uh snails starfish i mean um, is, is that a, uh, is that little, yeah, guys. little guys, is that a pest out, uh, in the Solomons? I don't see them. I don't see them. And definitely like when I was taking care of reef tanks in Los Angeles, you know, once one got in a tank, it, it was a thing, yeah. right? It was more a thing on our, on our acrylic tanks. Cause if you're using a magnet, they can get under the magnet and scratch up the acrylic. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I don't see them here and it's, you know, I'm not looking, but I don't see them here really on, on, on corals here. We'll get blue-eyed crabs, the, the really annoying crabs you get from farms. So we get blue-eyed crabs, and then we get the little coral croucher um, gobies, the, you know, black clown gobies, basically. We'll get those in corals. And then there's some little, there's a couple little shrimps that we'll get that seem to be commensal, but I don't see Asterina stars. At least I haven't seen them. And like, you know, after we clear the, the raceways of, of coral for an export, I don't see them lingering in the tanks. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I always think that... Um... Harlequin sh uh, shrimp are the best uh, defense against those yeah. uh, starfish. And it's kind of a sad thing because you know they'll uh, you put one of those things in uh, in, a, in a home reef aquarium, they'll uh, wipe out the uh, you know the uh, the Asterina starfish, star. but then they'll starve. Uh, yeah, if you, you got to get them out and give them to another reefing yeah. brother or sister to uh, kind of help them yeah. out and pass pass them. Yeah, if you can catch them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. So, all right, this. Uh, Another, um, you know, question I had for you in terms of any new locations that you're uh, collecting in, um, what, what does that take, man? I mean, it, like you said, there's got to be so much territory to cover. You know, how do you kind of map out a plan to kind of tap into a new frontier? 
Is it uh, just a matter of, um, you know, doing some scouting in your part to see what uh, areas look like, you know, kind of prime locations? It's, it's sort of all of the above. I mean, it's, it's, it's looking at maps and, 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 you know, charts and, you know, I don't want to give away too yeah. much. Yeah. Like there is competition yet, but, uh, it's really the biggest thing here is once you have an export license. So unlike Indonesia, where like if you have an export license, you're stuck to your state or your island, essentially, of where you're allowed to collect in. And you can't collect coral from another region and bring it over for export. That region has to export its own coral. Here in Solomons, I can export from anywhere in the Solomons. So if I fly to the other side of the country and collect coral, I can I can take that to farms and, and grow it. But what what it doesn't grant is the privilege to go to someone's reef. There's a whole lot of village sovereignty mm -hmm. here. Like every man is his own duke or earl. You know, every every village is its own sovereign territory. So if I want to collect, like I have to go to that village ahead of time, describe what I want to do, you know, make my pitch. A lot of times it's going weeks ahead of time, bring in some beetle nuts, bring in some cigarettes. I don't smoke <laughs> or chew vanilla, but you know, sitting under a tree and having a conversation. Um, and if you don't do that and you take liberties with like, oh, well, I collected from the neighbor, I come over here and collect, um, you'll get your boat will get boarded with machetes and angry people. <laughs> uh, they're not swinging them, but they're there to make a point, you know, um, so you don't do that. Um, there's, you know, a lot of the really good reefs have been set aside as marine protected zones, which is a good thing. Um, where, when I had Jake out in 2019, uh, he went out to Simon's reef, which is like now an established marine protected zone. Like you don't collect off that. You'll, you'll do jail time if you collect off that. Um, so I was going to ask you, like, yeah, have you been back to Simon's, uh, coral preserve, but I guess not. <laughs> no, I have okay. actually, we're actually going close to there in the next like four or five days. Yeah. It's, it's still looking good. I mean, he was for years, a Marine collector. So he, you know, he has an eye for coral and it's his reef. So whenever he saw cool stuff, he was like, Oh, I'll, I'll take a piece you know, collecting wildflowers. I'll take some seeds from that. I'll take some seeds from that. And yeah. He made his own little garden under the right, water. Exactly. Pretty, pretty much what he uh, was doing was taking stuff, I guess, uh, out in the reefs around in the surrounding area and kind of planting them in a, uh, in a little, um, what would you call a farm close to the Island? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, he's blessed with a really cool location where, you know, one kilometer to the left, he's got open ocean of sort of one type of topography, like open, open ocean, one kilometer or half a kilometer to the, to the, to the right, not east, it's more south, but you know, one kilometer the opposite direction, he's got more protected open ocean, like less, less wind battered open ocean, but clean water uh, in that channel. He's got different topography of like low energy, high energy. He's got it all. So he really is in like a prime location to build a, a garden of different types of coral, like a botanical garden, really a coral. That's so cool. What what about the uh, the coral mm -hmm. triangle, uh, Tim? Um, describe to people what that is again. Sure, sure. So coral triangle is uh, a collection of countries. It's 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 an area defined by the density of species. So it means that you've got, I believe, it's five hundred species of coral. So the mm -hmm. region of the sea is all of the Philippines. I'm, I guess I'm inverted from you, but all of the Philippines, uh, the the very eastern end of Malaysia or western end of in Indonesia the north side of Papua New Guinea and the, the right side of that triangle would be Solomon Islands. So Solomon Islands is just included in that, in that group of 500 uh, species. So, yeah. I mean, and, and, yeah, it's, it's a very abstract triangle. But yeah. And, and it sounds pretty, uh, pretty large area in terms of collecting and, and, um, oh, it's yeah. I mean, yeah. the entirety of, right? entirety of the Philippines, the majority of Indonesia, the entire North half of Papua New Guinea and Papua New Guinea is, almost a microcontinent. It's massive. Um, and all of the Solomon Islands. I mean, Solomon Islands alone, it's a thousand islands, 990 islands, and um, what, 400 miles long? I mean, it's it's yeah. huge. So, and that's only one leg of, of the Coral Triangle. So the Coral Triangle as a whole is, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of miles of ocean. How do you think the uh, the Solomon Islands is going to be, um, how, how, will things change with the upcoming ban on Indo uh, exporting, you know, being able to export Indo corals. Will, will that uh, change the dynamic, I, do you think? I don't know. I mean, we, we started this business five years ago when Indo was still locked up and the demand was pretty big. Um, with Indo closing down, I mean, that really just drove up demand for Indo corals. You know, that was in torch corals went to astronomical prices, you know, Indonesian torch corals. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I can't predict the future. I've tried to predict the future and it's never exactly gone the way I thought it would go. So I think I'm out of the... Uh, prognostication business. Um, it's definitely a hope. I mean, it's what's, what's bad for Indonesian coral exporters might be good for me. Um, 
I don't want to, you know, dance at their misfortune, but if, if demand goes up, that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Right. Um, there's other exporters, you know, there's, there's Tonga can fill up some of that, uh, on, you know, the, I guess the lower end side, um, they, they've tried farm corals out of Marshall islands at one point, yep. other countries can export corals with, with, if the conditions are right. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm poised and ready if, if, um, global demand goes up, it's hard um, competing. I mean, I'm, I'm operating out of my pocketbook, right? Like I don't have deep, deep pockets to, to, you know, deep amounts of capital to draw on to, to scale up. So a lot of this has been, you know, there's, there's been some missed opportunities because I'm just not ready to capitalize yeah. on them. But, um, uh, should Indo close down, I mean, no longer am I compared to the, God, I don't, I don't even know how many operators there are in Indonesia, but they're working with, you know, land prices that are a 10th of what they are here in Solomon's and labor wow. costs that are a quarter of what they are here. Um, it's not a cheap country to operate in. Um, you know, house rentals are almost the price of like, it's not as expensive as Los Angeles where I'm from, but it's like Florida pricing to rent a house here, you oh. know, 2000 us a, a month to rent a, a, an average, you know, not fancy house. It's not cheap. Um, so whereas Indonesia, I mean, I'd be spending a quarter of that 500 bucks or less for a, you know, a two-story house, the pool and sweet air con. Like I don't have that here. You know, I couldn't afford that if I wanted to. So it's, it's, a, it's a tougher business climate to operate in Solomon's. Um, and, you know, your average consumer in the United States doesn't care. They just want their coral at a, at a cheap price. Right. right. So it, it rubbed me a little bit and, and I've had to get over it because, you know, you got to go with what the market demands. So I definitely learned that. But, you know, when I present a coral and they're like, oh, that looks like Tonga, I'll pay Tonga prices or, oh, that looks like Indo, I'll pay Indo prices. Like, ah. Uh, but it's so much harder to get and it's, it's genetically different and, you know, kind of my, my own spiel with how the reptile market cares about stuff like that. Like, oh, this is from this weird, obscure island that people only go to once a year, once every five years, the coral buying market or the Instagram fat market, whatever, they, they don't care. And if I do, that doesn't help me sell corals. So, uh, that's, I guess that's my long way of answering. If Indo shuts down, I guess it would probably be easier to sell. Corals. Yeah. What, what are the, uh, yeah. like basic differences in terms of the types of corals that you could export from the Solomon versus the types of corals that you could export from, from Indo? I mean, are there like any obvious differences or, or, or is it not? I, I think, and I could be wrong. I could totally be wrong here, but I believe that like Europe, uh, has a ban on euphelia from Indonesia. I think that that it was decided on their end, on the receiving side, that it was not being collected at a sustainable or ethical way. And so they they put the kibosh on it. I think they can buy from Australia and because I don't think that falls under that ban. And I would assume that means that they're allowed to buy from us or they're allowed to import from us. Um, so that might be one, but that's the only one that I know of off, off top of hand. I mean, I, I really have had to sort of bury my head in, in what's going on here. When I was working in, in Los Angeles and importing, I was so much more up to date with, uh, you know, current trends, yeah. current buying trends. And also, you know, in a previous iteration of this company, I was going back home every couple months. And so I could sort of get the pulse on things a lot better. Now I'm, I'm here, I'm here full time. And, um, it's, it's been a good thing for the business here, but it's been a bad thing as, as far as my you know, just awareness of what's going on in Australia and what's going on in Indonesia. Yeah. What are people in Hong Kong buying? You know, it's, it, it, it has changed. Uh, my, my awareness has definitely changed. I'm a lot more dependent upon my customers, which is a little bit scary. So, you know, here, here's, here's an honest question from Messiah, um, Mitra. Uh, why did Tim choose to farm in Solomon islands despite the high prices and difficulties? Why, uh, why Solomon? Sure. Um, I was first here in 2008 as a consultant for uh, Dave Palmer's company, Aquarium Arts, uh, Pacific Aqua Farms. Uh, I was working for him in Los Angeles and he sent me out here as a consultant and I fell in love with the place. Um, when I decided to start this business, so based on those connections and those friends and that just you know time here, I spent months here. Um, so based on that, uh, in 2008, I was in Australia on a buying trip when Australia was the only exporting company or country of note. And um, essentially, the the guys that I went there with, Jake had invited me out. Uh, I'll tell the Jake story another time, but uh, no, I, no, I had to find ahead. a place you to stay. Last minute. Okay, so he when he was setting up the um, the Australian Reef Palooza, not Reef Palooza, uh, Restock, yeah, Restock yeah. Australia. Um, he's like, hey Tim, like I'd love for you to come out. You know, I want you to work, like work the door or something. But like, come on out, and I will take care of your room and board. Just you take care of your airplane ticket. So it's like. 
I fly out there and volunteer work for free. Like, <laughs> thanks, dude. <You> know? <laughs> but, but okay, all right, I got room and board at least, you know? And so I, I, I had enough money saved up to do that. And so I told a coworker and he's like, well, I want to go too. Okay, we'll both go, you know? And then he was like, well, we got to tell our boss. I'm like, Fuck, don't tell our boss. <laughs> right, I got to tell our boss. You know, I, I would just say, I, I want a week off, you know? But he's like, okay. So he told the boss and boss is like, well, I want to go too. And so now it's a company trip. Mm-hmm. So that meant that airfare was covered. That was, that was kind of nice. nice. Um, that was expensive, expensive airfare. Um, and then, you know, he invited his wife and it became like a, a, a kind of a party, you know? And so he got out there. We were the only Americans there. Wow. So like we were the, we were the brightest bell at the ball, yeah. you know, like everyone was like, Oh, yeah. come out to our station and come out to Western Australia, come up to Brisbane, come over to, come over to Darwin. And so between the four of us, we, we kind of had our dance cards filled as far as like, okay, you're going to go to Brisbane. You're going to go to Perth. You're going to go to Darwin. You're going to go to Cairns. Like we, you know, going to all these facilities. And that was like, well, Tim, where are you going to go? Like, what are you going to do? And like, well, Solomon's is next door. You know, Solomon's is 600 bucks US to fly there. Let's see what's going on. Cause I'd heard that the station uh, had gone bankrupt. And so came up here and hooked up with, you know, some of my old, old friends from here and you're not working, you're not working, you're not working. Do you want to work? Do you want to work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I put together a business plan and um, it made sense. So it was sort of a, the business was uh, in hibernation, you know, so it wasn't like starting from, from the ground up. It really was shaking off the dust yeah. and, you know, sort of finding what, what was efficient, and what wasn't efficient and, you know, recalibrating it to suit my needs. So, yeah. Um, all right. Getting back to pol- politics, Stur- Sturgis Reef is wondering, what is the local regulation like there? And do you see much pollution that affects the reefs? Um, in town, there's a lot of pollution. I mean, no one no one thinks twice about throwing their trash in a local stream or river. Uh, it's, it's gross. Um, it's so, uh, on a, on a pedestrian level, the trap, the, the pollution is really bad and all that goes right down the sea. So every time it rains, uh, streams are, are flooded because the drains and the, and the underpasses are clogged yeah. up. And so that creates a lot of erosion. So anytime it rains noteworthy wise, there is mud. The whole coastline is covered in mud. After about that three sucks. days that goes down. Um, I've, it, it's gross. Uh, it's not a fight I can fight now. The the Department Ministry of the Environment, who issues CITES permits, uh, actually just instituted a plastic bag ban, uh, which means that the shopping T-shirt plastic bags, yep. you know, like the you know two handle yep. red thin plastic bags, those are now outlawed. And Good. um, and small single use plastic bottles are outlawed as well. Um, so that might make a difference. I'm still seeing the big liter and a half bottles getting thrown in the in the streams mm. and stuff. Um, fishing line isn't being regulated and a lot of the fish, a lot of the reefs I dive on, I actually have to have a knife to like make sure I don't get snagged with fishing lines, just remnant ghost fishing lines. Um, so on a, again, on a pedestrian level, pollution is pretty bad here. I've been on reefs. So like one of my favorite reefs to collect on just outside of town, there was a logging dam put out cause there's logging is the main industry. And of course that puts a lot of mud in the water. Um, that logging dam, it's also next to a stream. And so the logging dam creates erosion and kind of disrupts the coastline. So after rains, you'll have mud in the water. And from that stream, you'll have like a freshwater lens running on the top of the water for a bit mm. until it mixes. And like, I've been collecting Acpora robusta growing straight up through that, that freshwater lens and into the muddy, nasty freshwater. And that robusta has perfect, you know, the green with the pink tips, it's happy. It's, it's showing all signs that it's getting exactly what it wants, despite freshwater runoff, land-based, you know, terogenous pollution. Uh, there was a ship because it's a logging area, there was a ship maybe hmm, a half kilometer, 300 meters, 400 meters upstream of where I was. And they're hosing off their deck and there's oil slick coming off of that because they don't care. Um, and those corals look fine. So I think that there's a lot of um, resiliency in corals that are used to not perfect conditions. Um, in the harbor, I've seen, I think it was Postalipora growing on a rock right where all these big industrial boats are anchoring and setting up. So like, what's that line from uh Jurassic park nature finds yes. a way. Yeah. You know? Like it, it's, yeah. it's, it's corals tough here. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that first question we got about, about bleaching, I am seeing bleaching. So, you know, it's, it's taking hits, but I think it keeps, it stands back up, you know? Yeah. Um, St- you know. Sturgis reef says, yeah, high nutrients, I guess, laugh out loud. That, I, I, that's that's interesting because you know I would I would assume that the um, the corals that are are thriving near the uh, you know the areas where you're seeing all this uh, influx from you know runoff and, and what have you 
can can tolerate much higher nutrients and stuff that uh, versus stuff that's further out, right? Right, correct. So on this reef, which is sort of bounded like this, this bay bounds Honiara, and you've got seventy thousand people, you know, putting their waste. It's all septic, which means that there is leaching. There's 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 nutrients. Let's just let's just say nutrients running into the mm. sea. Um, it's on the leeward side that I'm seeing milliporans, which are a, a hungry, you know, high energy, high light, high nutrient demanding coral. Um, so that very well could be part of the reason that they're so happy here. And I see more of them here than I do on other reefs that have similar facings, you know, similar coastline facing, similar wind and, and swell direction. But here they're they're denser, and it very likely is nutrient available. How, how do you uh, how so, do you but that's how it. do you manage that in your holding facility? You know, if you've got corals that are being collected from different areas with di different parameters, you know, maybe some that are getting collected from waters with high nutrients versus low nutrients. How do you, how do you manage that in terms of keeping those corals happy before you export them? A lot of that is you know, placement in the facility, knowing which tanks are warmer, knowing which tanks are cooler, uh, how long we run our pumps for, how much water flow oxygenation we give them. Um, you know, deep water corals that I'm collecting at 70, 80, sometimes even 90 feet, they don't want the conditions that millipore wants. They'll, they'll stress out and die quickly. Um, so yeah, keeping those away from, I mean, you can kind of see the, yeah, man, why don't you, uh, give us a little, uh, dime tour of the around. facility. Yeah. Let's, let's do that. Why not? And I'll change the camera facing, yeah. flip your camera around, give everybody a, uh, a look-see in terms of what, uh, you got going on there. So we're at three holding tanks right now, um, which we built, we built by hand here. Actually, I need to, I need to paint this guy. Um, but, uh, yeah, so let me turn off our pumps and, um, just remember to turn them back on after you, uh, show right. us. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm the guy who yells at people for not turning back on. Um, so like right now I've, I've got our deep waters facing sunlight just because we collected them early and I want them to, to keep color. Those are all deep um, water acros. I, these are, these are all deep water acropora. Um, so with these guys, let's settle a little bit with these guys, they, they, they're going to be in captivity a bit long. And so I want to keep their sugar content. I want them to photosynthesize. Um, so we've got some recordias that are worth showing. Let's see. Thanks. Nice. These are recordias that we collect at shallow water. I'll, I'll get a, cool. um, nice. Yeah. I'll get their orange mouth, purple, you know, purple. They're, they're nice. Um, some rhodactus mushrooms here these are it's not showing in sunlight i'll get a blue light um unfortunately it's gonna be swamped out by all the sunlight but yeah. um these do fluoresce red they're they're real pretty um we've got some farmed uh leather corals in stock the uh yellow leathers that everyone knows from uh fiji yep we also have a pretty nice yellow leather here nice yeah sweet so yellow leather and then we have what we call devil's hand leather but singularia yep a green singularia and these are all you know we make the discs here we show the villagers how to make them and, and they go from there but yeah i think most of the most of the people online are probably into acropora so um let me get my my blue light out and yeah. see if that'll yeah light them show up. These off a little better yeah give me a give me a minute it's the first time i've done this so i'm about as tech savvy as most people's grandpa <laughs> putting, putting kind on of the, the uh the orange the yellow lens there exactly exactly all right so again it's going to get drowned out here's actually that's a that's a blue millipora that's going out to farm right now so we're actually going to go drop this off but um when you say going out to farm what do you mean so if i see a coral that catches my eye and it's like this one we we were able to you know chew pieces off of it that were trimble in size for export but this piece is just not really exportable it's not photogenic yeah but the you know genetics are good on it so that's going to go to a farm uh for propagation there's some farm, meaning a farm out in, in the wild. In the provinces, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, here's some Lago. And fortunately, so this thing looks amazing at night, but uh, blown out with, it's got like pink tips and, and green, but it's just not going to show very well during daylight, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. But um, Lacanis, more Lago. We've got some Plana over here. Love That's the Plana. Like yeah, it's a great coral. So we clicked at that piece. Got some the, over uh, here. The, the Crayola plana is like one of my favorites. Oh yeah, a great know. coral. Yeah, yeah. A great. They're coral. a little sensitive though, too. You know, I, I find them. They to be are. Yeah, sensitive. like all like all of our deep water acroporas, they are. Let me turn this light off. Light, turn off. All right, there we go. Lights off. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill the orange filter. I yeah. think it's just not really. Yeah. Unfortunately, not working. But yeah, we've got about what 
180 pieces of deep water aquaphor in right now. Good mix of Locanis and Planas and Aculeus. That looks like, actually looks like Caroloniana with really long polyps. Um, here is another piece. I don't know if you can see this guy, but. Nice. Is that? Yeah. I mean, out of the, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, like I mean, like you're saying, it, it's 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 kind of like all um, blown out in terms of you know you can't see any of the colors because you don't have any, uh, the the lighting on top of it. But right, it's white. It's I've got white sunlight on it. Yeah. But when these go to the United States, within about they'll, they'll probably have to rest for a few weeks. But um, that's when we start to see oranges and, and colors really come out of them. Um, here, lobophilias, lobos symphalias. I think that's been unionized, right? Lobophilia and symphalia has been sort of a um, they've 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 rejoined the groups. Oh yeah. Um, here is a nice gold torch, kind of a pink peachy gold torch. Yeah. So that was collected. This is actually collected in the, um, in the same area that I collect, um, shallow water, um, shallow water, like, uh, milliporous. But, uh, I, I went a little bit deeper, went to see what else I could find there. And then some chalice corals and like monopora sebuensis. This is that one that it's got blue polyps and it'll turn really orange yeah. under captive condition, like a beach bum. What's uh, oh, that, that's, that's a cool, like that's a cool Monty. Um, yeah. Bahama Lama Coral, what's happening, Remy? Um, so any, anything, new, any new discoveries, anything really cool that Tim, that you've collected recently that uh, you haven't seen before? Hmm. Hmm. Any that I can disclose? <laughs> yeah, no, not, they're not, not. They're not like not, being sequestered in a secret day. part of the facility. There. Yeah, not not today. We did see. I mean, these are kind of cool. So these, I don't think they're going to go for export. Um, but my my one of my station managers was out. It was Easter weekend, and he was out uh, just sort of diving and poking around, and he pulled up these yellow seahorses. Uh -huh. <laughs> my facility. And I don't know the species. I, I'm not a seahorse expert uh -huh. by any means. Yeah. Um, but this this fella was actually you can see his belly swollen he gave he uh let go of the babies so they're they're clustered up over here they're going to go back out in the sea but the um, babies yeah we wanted to identify the species at least yeah again i'm sorry it's not photographing very well but there's probably about 150 little seahorses poking around this this uh, coral holding facility we turned off the the drains out of the ocean but uh yeah we got four of them so and they're all yellow i again i don't know if they're i don't know the species and they're not going to go for export because I believe all, um, I'm going to turn the camera back around. I believe all, uh, seahorses or CITES protected in the same way that like clans and corals and, and all that are. So, but you know what, sh it was an do, uh, show us the, uh, show us like the actual, um, you know, shoreline. I mean, your facility is right there, yeah, sure. you know, let's, uh, yeah. let's just check that out while you're, uh, while yeah. finish off the, uh, the tour there in terms of yeah. exactly where it's you are in the uh solomons yeah in the yeah so there you go there's the ocean yeah yeah we're right i mean this the facility had to be with you know access to fresh seawater because um, that's, what you're, that's what you're bringing into your uh, holding tanks right right it, we wanted to be able to bring in fresh seawater and then launch a boat but twice we've built boat ramps and you can see these boat ramps get destroyed twice. the cyclones are sort of lens right here on the facility and so we'll get we'll get uh waves splashing higher than that light post so damn man, that's, that's gotta like uh that's gotta be a drag in terms of your holding tanks it it's um yeah it's a it's a struggle so between december and let's say december and february it's tough it's tough to you know predict when we'll be able to operate out of here um another thing again i don't know if it's going to show in the um I'm just going to show in the uh, video, but you can see this dock is made out of um, a bunch of World War II uh, artillery shells that make up the uh, the volume of this dock. This was a dump site, so <laughs> buried in the yeah. uh, no in the uh, in concrete. Let me turn around. Like this one, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's hundreds and hundreds of these things. There's got to be. So, yeah, the facility uh, there's got to be some heavy metals in the water around those things. Yeah, well, yeah, steel. Um, we did. We actually did a. a you know, I, I worked. For, I worked with Triton for a long time, and uh, we had sort of a funny experience where a guy dropped a hammer in his tank, and then we ran the Triton analysis on it, and it was actually actually wasn't creating a problem. But that was one hammer in a tank, not tons of steel on a dock yeah right <laughs> a little bit um yeah it's worth actually running a, 
an analysis on it, right? Like Triton is, they have a, they have a lab in Cairns that's only maybe 200 miles away from here, 250 miles away from here. So I'm sure I can get them a sample. Um, speaking of Triton, you were on that uh, expedition uh, years ago, right? In terms of the search yeah. with, with Jake, in search of the uh, the true purple monster. We talked about that, I think, the last time I had you on. And, he, uh, and, and, did, I, yeah. and, I, and I remember you, you saying that uh, there was likely going to be some um, some of that purple monster being exported to the States. What's what's going on with that, man? Is there any, uh, any so news on we, that? We sent, we sent uh, 10 pieces so far have gone into the States. Um, we're set up to collect more. Uh, this weekend nice. um it's now being farmed in in a pretty good quantity so yeah wow. that's something you expect to see on the market that's gonna yeah. be so cool it, d does it look like the uh traditional uh tyree purple monster that all the hobbyists know in terms of kind of like the uh the dense thicker branches or because I, I think there yeah, was also I, I, like I, some different kind of um you know uh shapes to that coral that that uh, you guys had seen on that uh that uh, follow-up expedition initial the initial set that we sent out was farmed in a really goofy way they it was it was farmed in a way that's really good for reef restoration but not for coral sales so they put it on strings and on those strings it was sort of falling as it was growing and so it was fighting you know it was it was growing in a really weird way to right itself again it's it, it grows a lot of volume of coral quickly and it's good for reef restoration when your only goal is to put coral on a reef but when you're trying to sell to a american market they want it to have a concrete disc grown more like a christmas tree you know, grown vertically. Right. So uh, we've made that correction, um, and uh, we'll we'll see. That's what's going to be coming in. But when we collected, there was, you know, some internet experts were uh, were saying that, oh, that's the that's the Solomon Island purple monster. It's not the OG purple monster, and it's not. I mean, like I, I do believe in strains, right? So if you have this strain of purple monsters collected in 1995 through Tyree, that's that's a one of you know that's what that is, right? That's that's per month from that. We went to the exact same reef, you know, collected from the exact same reef that that coral was collected from. So genetically, it's probably 99.99 in a lot of numbers after that percent the same coral, right? But is it that exact strain with that exact same, you know, history yeah. of facing and sea swell? Uh, no, it's not. Um, and corals do, um, they, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll release symbionts and retake up new symbionts as, as ocean conditions change. So it could have a different set of zooxanthellae in it and respond differently to different stimulus. But was it the same species, the same strain of the same species collected on the same reef? Yeah. Yeah, it was the exact same reef. But, um, you know, they're saying polyp color was slightly different and it's entirely possible. You know, again, different growing conditions. We're not growing under the exact same lights or bulbs or water chemistry or salt mixes that we were in 1995. So things change. But um you know, I, I think we got as close as you can to, to a bullseye on collecting that species, that coral from that location. But um, I, I wish that there was a better registry of like, you know, I, I've worked for coral, you know, mail order coral, ex, coral exporters, coral shippers throughout the United States. Uh, I've worked for importing companies like I've seen kind of every level of coral custody coming into the United States and getting sold. And a wild coral comes in from Indonesia. 15 different retailers can buy it and they all call it 15 different yeah. things, even though it's coming in from the same farmer from the same, you know, batch that's a, from the same that's mother a colony in Indonesia. It's annoying because I don't think it helps anybody. Um, but I understand the reason that these retailers are doing it. Um, I just wish there was maybe a better naming system, more scientific or, you know, you look at uh, Meckley's in, in, in the, in the room, like he's a major farm producing line strains and really trying to keep that history. And that's commendable. It's tough to do. It's, I, I, I understand how tough that fight is. So I don't know. I, there's nothing. I Once I sell a coral, it's out of my hands. I can't control who calls something what and what they want yeah. to sell it for. No, it's kind of, one, one coral. What's that? I was going to say, it's got to be kind of almost like a helpless feeling a little bit. You're passing it off it is, and then uh, it's just kind of, uh, it's out of your hands. You want to protect your brand. Yeah, you want to protect your your brand that you built. I mean, I put my life a lot of taking a lot of risks on my life and my credit, and my romantic life and all that of being out here, you know. <laughs> and then you sell a product to somebody, they can do whatever they want with it. It's scary. Uh, but that's what I signed up for, right? Um, famously, I had a coral that we collected. I think I saw forty dollars for it, maybe landed, and it sold for like sixty five hundred dollars wholesale. Sixty five hundred. For a colony. Whoa. Yeah, for a graph for a colony. 
Yeah, this is a that was rad. Um, I really wish that the vendor put Solomon Islands on it, at least said where it came from. <laughs> but the vendors, they want to keep that stuff secret for their own reasons. So it's, you know, no one's on a contract. It's not, uh, you know, we're not Monsanto selling seeds where there's patents on the seed genetics and, you know, people have to pay you royalties. It's it's out of my hands at that point. So, do, yeah. Do, I mean, do you, uh, yeah, do you adjust up. pricing based on those sorts of uh, episodes where, uh, you know, all of us and you get wind of what it uh, retails for and then you're like, shit, man, I got to make some money on this if, stuff. If I know that everyone needs to make money. Right. And I want my customers to be excited to open a box and like there might be the next thousand dollar coral in there. Right. Like I want them to feel comfortable knowing that if I send them a box of coral, they're going to make money. Right. I don't it would be greedy to be like, well, I have to make my, you know, 50 percent or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, every exporter has their own way of doing it. Some of the Australian guys have seen like if they see something truly unusual, they'll put an auction on that one coral and then whoever wins the auction, like it'll get added into their whole order. It's not just a one-off. Um, that's a lot of organization. And I, I really want to be focusing on being in the water. Um, but I've seen that idea floated. Um, it generally speaking, I mean, I want my customers to have faith because I, I know where I am in the food chain, right? Like I'm not, I'm not a retailer. I'm not, I'm not even, I'm not an importer, right? Like they've got their own risks and liabilities with those companies and higher labor costs and higher fixed costs of, you know, all, and all those things. So I get them coral. They then, sell it and 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 they're entitled to make as much money as they can as long as their customers are happy themselves fair, so, fair enough yeah. um bahama lama yeah. coral remy thank you very much man for that super chat comment is tradition yes the uh, super chat tradition appreciate it dude um back to the uh, purple monster the the the, uh, the stuff that you've been collecting and uh, exporting the uh, signature white polyps uh you Mostly. know what i don't want i don't want to Commit to that. I'll, I'll bring some pieces in this week and I'll be able to look at them a lot closer. I'm happy to send you some photos, but in the wild, I didn't see it, but in the wild, I, I don't have the conditions to like get polyps out, sit there and photograph yeah. it with the macro. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty limited on technology here. So likely yes, but I don't want to make a promise that I can't deliver on. I, ho I hope that that's fair. Yeah, no, I, I hear you, man. I mean, I've, I've, I've got purple monster <clears throat> And, and mm -hmm. I've had it, I've had it, uh, in different, um, tanks over the years and, and, uh, it not, you don't always see the, uh, the white, um, polyps. They're not always, uh, you know, visible. I think it just kind of depends on the, um, the conditions of the parameters of the tank and, and the lighting and all that sort of thing. It's, it's not always like, you know, people are like, unless it's got the white polyps, it's not an OG Tyree purple monster, right. but I don't think that's always right. the case. I mean, I don't, I don't think I've always noticed that up in, 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 in my, um, you know, purple monster, um, frags colonies that was jake that was jake's observation and i mean he was he was here with me collecting it i i you know that that's that's a perfectly fair observation um i've handled i mean i remember in what 2005 like cutting up colonies of purple monster when i was working with vivid um i didn't notice the white polyps on on it then um but you know again that if, if tyree purple monster is the one from 1995 that's that's valid that's 100 percent valid the one that we collected in 2015 was from that expedition and we only had maybe three or four small pieces made it to um made it to the united states from that trip we didn't collect everything we saw we wanted to leave it behind um jake didn't disclose this but when he came back in 2019 i was focused on getting my license sorted out so i couldn't go with him back out to that reef but it got it got wiped out by a cyclone we've since found it again on that reef but the the patch that we had collected and documented in 2015 was wiped out and it's you know re regrown and it's like nature can get, you know, you can have a cyclone come through and destroy some corals and then it reseeds. It's not like that's the only location. It's, it's all around that area. Uh, but you know, that specific strain technically is off the market too, as long as, you know, that was the UC purple monster is what we were calling it at that point. Cause it was, it landed at UC. What we're collecting now, again, from the same Island, from the same reef, from that same area, but it's not 2015 strain, yeah. right? It's, it's different. It adapts. I think that the, yeah, but I think the logistics of trying to be like, oh, well, this is the 2024, you know, unless we're barcoding corals, which I'm just not there yet, um, and don't plan on being. Like, you do see that from Indonesia, where each coral, the mariculture corals come in with a little bar yeah. tag, a little barcode. I mean, I, I think that's rad. Um, a lot of information can be gained from that, but that requires everyone agreeing to the same code and, and playing by the same rules. And unfortunately, it's sort of wild west. Once it hits the United States market, people are going to call it, you know, whatever 
creative Instagram name they I can. I mean, unless so. you're doing genetic testing, right, in terms of the original OG right. Purple Monster that was collected back in 95 or whatever it was um, versus what right. you're collecting there, now. There's people out there that can do that. Yeah, there's people out there that can do that. If, if, if anyone in chat or whatever wants to line that up, I'm happy to send specimens. Um, I don't have any OG on hand. You, you might but, get some uh, imposters out to there that'd be like, yeah, send it to me. I'll uh, take care of that. Just, they want to get the... Uh... Sure. Oh, for sure. For sure. <laughs> there, are, there are accredited labs that do genetic studies. I mean, I remember uh, someone was trying to get blue millipora um, to see if like Palmer's blue or whatever. That's a, was, that's this a is kick, years that's a back. kick-ass piece. It's a great I've got coral. that coral. Yeah. I love that coral. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but they wanted a genetic sequence, that one. And I think at the time we had it. So we, I sent him some pieces. That was on, what, Reef Central I found that guy? So I could look him up again. But anyways, yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to send some some pieces for genetic uh, genetic testing uh, to see if if these are, in fact, the same strain. It's, you know, for what it's worth. I don't know if that would change the market price on anything, but um, it's peace of mind. Um, no. Just a little sidebar about the uh, blue millipora. Is that a rare, um, you know, morph of the uh, millie in terms of a blue millipora? Do you see a lot of so blue millies? If I'm, if I'm over a reef, I would say one in five hundred or blue is blue. Wow. Per, you know, uh, pink with with blue tips, pink green blue tips. Um, there's sort of a four color, the uh, pink fading into blue tips with green uh, tentacle polyps, and then a yellow axial. That's like my top of the line. That's like one in a thousand or wow. so I'll see. Um, we get a lot of pink out here. We get actually less green than pink. Pink's more common. Um, but those like, you know, multicolor and especially blue, you see way less of it. It's just less common. I love... Um, so when I see it, it's, it's always noteworthy. When yeah, I your uh, you probably eyes like grab grabs your attention. I, I love um, sunset millies. I think those are so cool. Oh, they're gorgeous. They're gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the first coral strains that like moved me where I was like, had a dream about that coral, you know, was a uh, sunset monopora, you know, that tangerine orange with like yeah. lime green polyps, just stunning coral. Yeah. Um, it's funny that that's not really a considered a fancy coral anymore, but it's such a pretty coral. Yeah, so, no, I mean, that's, that's yeah. like, that's like a starter type of coral now for a lot of people, you know, you can get like a frag for uh, 15, 20 bucks and grows like a freaking weed yep. and it is gorgeous. I think that's a great thing. I mean, I remember when that was a hundred dollar piece of coral and now it's, you know, oh hey, you should have some of this, and it's it's common, and that's a that's a testament to the captive farming, you know, aquaculture, of of how powerful that is, and 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 what a market force that is. I think that's a great thing. That that's sort of anybody who's against collecting coral for genetics in you know wild coral, I think I would throw that at them. Of like, here's a coral that used to be rare and exotic, and only a few pieces came in, and it's become almost ubiquitous because of people in the hobby keeping it alive and trading it, and you know giving it to friends or selling to friends cheaply like it's that's a cool thing that's, that's a cool so let's thing. um let's get into some questions and comments from the uh viewers yeah. uh, back um just again with the uh, purple monster i sent uh, meckley a, a piece uh, a while ago and, and chris says in the chat here mine is doing very very good it is puddling way better than the first piece i sent him two pieces and and, and the first piece i sent him crapped out after a while it it uh, it can be a uh, a tricky sensitive um, coral for sure. We had talked about, I believe, last time. So to reiterate, where I'm seeing it is warm, shallow water, low flow, not high flow. So shallow protected lagoons yeah. highlight those. So not just because it's low wave doesn't mean low light. Um, so it wants a lot of light, still almost stagnant hot water. That's where I'm seeing wow. it, and that's where I see it. I mean, purple, like Barney the Barney the dinosaur, purple wow. in in the wild, um, and that's where I've collected it from, and that's where we farm it because you know you want to keep corals in the conditions that it, that they do best in. Um, so I don't know if in captivity, if we're replicating that, you know, because we usually want to have high energy, high flow, thinking that you know what was Jake's flow in a can, more flow the better, yeah. it can't have enough yeah. flow. That's not the case with purple monster, so it might it might just get agitated from high flow conditions or outcompeted. By other corals in those conditions because it's famously hard to keep alive. It's a famously difficult coral. Well, the thing is so. that it is such a slow grower that um, so over time to be able to grow a big piece is challenging because there's a lot of things that can happen over time to any coral. A lot of you know, there's a, there's a lot of failure points and and um, you know the other thing is the fact that it's such a slow grower and if you have it in a uh, in a captive reef you know display tank. 
the chances are it's going to get overgrown or uh, shaded out by something else. You know, so it, it's very, right. very tough to right. place that coral in a in a reef tank and to kind of anticipate the the other corals' growth around it. You know, you really want to just give it a Better wide paint. berth. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I see it. I actually see it in the same areas. It'll be like a coral rubble area, shallow. I'm talking, I'm talking less than six feet deep. Sometimes even for like like wading depth, right? So four feet of deep water. Um, and it'll be in the same areas that I'm seeing like singularia tufts. So it'll be like a, like a, a rubbly reef flat, not a lot of coral. And then you'll have a balmy with like uh, green leathers. Like I'll see in areas like that where, you know, other corals can't hang. Right. So it's not getting out competed by their acros because other acros don't like that area. It's too bright. It's too warm. You know, it, it can handle that, that super sort of blasted, you know, high heat, high light not a lot of flow and oxygenation and other corals just, just crap out. So it might just be that, that conditions aren't dialed up enough for it so that other corals can out compete it. Um, let me ask you, but I don't, I've never seen it in cool water. Yeah. Interesting. Let me ask you a related question to the purple monster and then we're going to, uh, I'm going to stop, um, obsessing over this coral, even though I love it. Um, <laughs> I think the, we got to get you out here. So you can oh, keep that would be pretty, pretty <laughs> unbelievable. Um, I think the last time I had you on, you mentioned, um, or maybe it was Jake that wrote in his uh, article about the expedition about uh, also finding some some blue monster coral. Is that something that you've seen lately? Some coral that is similar? Yeah, it was, yeah. So uh, just a, a color variation of the same species. Uh, we did see, so Longosiathus, it's Acropora longosiathus is the strain, is the species. I've seen it in other areas and it looks completely different. I mean, the, the polyp structure is the same, but the coral structure is a lot more like Echinata under different conditions. And so if I was to say, this is purple monster, it looks like a, like a Echinata on steroids. People would be like, you're just trying to use the monster name. Like it's the same species. It's just different cap different wild conditions create a different, you know, different form. It's, it's adapted to different, still low energy, cooler water, lower light you know, maybe a little more flow, but different conditions. Um, so that'd be a monster as well. But when we were out collecting, yeah, there was, there was some gradations in that purple to blue. So that was where blue monster came up. Also, we saw more of a green undertone that I don't think OG was showing. The OG, OG per monster. I mean, you've had it long enough under different conditions. Does it green out a little bit I know, on, the, on the growth I know edges? I've seen the green, um, green in the, and, and, and some of the, uh, the frags that I've sent him. And, uh, I think, yeah, if I look at depending mm -hmm. on, the piece that I have under uh, my halides, I can kind of like see a, a faint, faint green uh, tint, but not under the LEDs. Okay. But yeah, so I think that's that's right. something oh, that's, that's true. Um, okay. Did did we talk about what species is the uh, the purple uh, monster? Is it a little ripe piece? I believe, yeah, I believe it's it's longus Uh When I was talking to Jake about it, he was he at first thought it was Cofidacula, Acropora Cofidacula. Um, and then we looked more at longus iathus. I believe it's longus iathus. So that's where that, that's, that's, I'm sticking with longus iathus. So, but it was, it was a bit of a toss up between Acropora cofidactyla and, and Acropora longus iathus. So I'm, I'm the former. And I think I got Jake onto it as well. I think he agreed. But, you know, when you get something in your head and it's hard to let go of it, <laughs> even when you, you agree in a conversation, like, oh, yeah, you're right. And then five years later, you're back to yeah, your old idea kind of... and you have to get sort of re reconvinced. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Speaking of um, species, um, Big ES is uh, asking, <clears throat> and this is a question that's come up before on this um, live stream: Are uh, spathiolatus considered now uh, millies now? I so I don't think that they're the same. Um, I have on the reef that I usually collect millipora. I've collected one spathiolata, um, one relatively large colony. The way you see it from Australia, where it's that that really pastel sort of pink to green radiation, you know, a uh, thicker branch structure than Acropora millipora, um, definitely thicker than Prostrata. So I do see a difference. And again, same, it's not like, like the, the, the argument would be like Spathulata is just millipora under different conditions. Hmm. So to counter that, I've seen Spathulata on the exact same reef that I collect thousands now of milliporas under the exact same conditions, same flow, same depth, same everything, and it's different. So yeah, it's genetically a different coral. Again, it would take genetic testing to prove it, but under, under 
identical conditions, it looks different. Yeah, Jason Langer uh, says genetic testing is not cheap, but so much could be gleaned from it for sure. Yeah, that would that would be cool, like to to no. to, to to be able right. to have yeah, that. it's it's just what the, is is the juice worth the squeeze? Yeah, yeah, like like that 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 to know the difference. It's like oh, okay, now we figured it out. Like, is that worth thousands of dollars of testing? Not for most people. So so getting back to yeah, uh, the spathulata versus uh, milli and prostrata and whatnot, um, I think the perception is that spathulata is a harder coral to keep if if you're um, you know buying into the fact that a spathulata is different than a millipora. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't. So I have never seen it where it's dominant on a reef. So I can't say like, this is what the conditions it really likes are. I've been on reefs where millipora is dominant. I've been on reefs where echinata, um, even speciosa is dominant, right? On, in certain areas and certain, certain conditions. And acropora likes to do that. Where acropora can thrive, its whole niche is to outcompete and, you know, claim real estate faster than other corals can. I have, I've only seen here in the Solomons, one piece that I can verify is spapulata and it was intermixed with milliporus. So I, I don't know exactly, you know, where maybe if it's a little cooler or a little more south facing. And that's just going to take time to um to to lay claim to. Uh, one thing that you brought up earlier that I didn't get a chance to to riff on and if yeah. I may, um exploration here. So during the original incarnation of Solomon's exports, um there was one American exporter and a three or four locals. They only had one football field size island called New, uh, Big Nuhu that they collected on, Little Nuhu and some, su and some submerged reefs. There was Tandai for deep water and the west, the west end of, of Haniara for Millipora. Across the bay in, in Florida, it was mostly villagers bringing coral. It wasn't a whole lot of going there to collect coral. That was the entire Solomon export market for 20 plus years or nearly 20 years. I've inherited a lot of those same dive sites, but I'm trying to expand on it. I think if we were looking at it by map and sort of highlighting the, the amount of reef, probably four to five percent of the actual reefs of this country have been, you know, documented and seen. Meaning 95 percent of it is still unexplored, mm. undeveloped, un, you know, those rocks haven't been turned over to see what yeah. bugs are on the other side, right? Like, so, you know, getting a boat and getting out there is really key to to this to this working, yeah, to this just just being what it could be. Um, Indonesia, there's hundreds and hundreds of operators in Australia, you've got, you know, $2 million boats that are out for, you know, two weeks at a time doing these expeditions mm -hmm. and, and checking stuff out. I'm still using a little, little, you know, 40 horsepower out, <laughs> outboard fiberglass boat and trying to get as far as I can afield. Like we're not to do an expedition is hard here. Um, but to try to both balance a business and balance the exploration aspects and finding new stuff, it's a lot of, it's, it's hard to satisfy all those needs while keeping the business profitable. Um, but, you know, there's so much un undiscovered here. There's so much. Uh, I'm looking at some deep water reefs right now that, you know, I, I don't want to give away too much, but, but deep water is where I'm really seeing things that could be amazing. And those don't even show up on, you know, on surface maps. Those aren't even, those are, those are underwater seamount type stuff that, uh, that I want to be checking out. So that's where, that's where my attention's at right now. Do you think new but species? The, new you know, the, the pitch is 95% of this country. And I think, I think verifiably. Do you, do you think uh, you're, you're going to uh, potentially see new species of corals in terms of the uh, the deep water acros you're uh, potentially going to be diving to? Strains, if not species, strains. Uh, on the LPS front, last time I had a good conversation with um, a sit-down company. I've, I've talked to him since then, but last time we had a really good, long sit-down conversation with Julian Sprung because he spent weeks out here on Liverboard Billy Kiki back when he, made, when he made his first books. If you look at his first you know, corals of... The Pacific books or the, the the two books of corals and the and the invertebrates books that he put out. Um, half of those photos are Solomon Islands, Solomon Islands, Solomon Islands. You know, photo credit Solomon Islands. Um, last time I sat down with him, he he described three different soft coral species that he knows locations of and where to find here. That just he didn't have time to to describe them. I mean, there's a lot of of undocumented, undescribed species here. That's so cool. So and stuff that I'm sure. That you know, I'm looking for bright, sellable milliporas. I'm not looking at you know, I'm not looking for jake corals. I'm looking, I'm not looking for the oddballs, yeah. you know, because so, I have to keep the lights on. But um, <laughs> as far as species, I'm sure I've swam over a bunch of them that were you know still just didn't catch my attention because I wasn't yeah. looking for them. Yeah. 
All right, some more um, questions here from the viewers. Sturgis Reef, um, yeah. speaking of deep water, how are you collecting at 90 feet? Are you um, using mixed gas to stay down long, or are you just uh, doing short dives? No, I'm, it's tanks. It tanks. We do short dives. I'm probably down for 15, 20 minutes, and then a good surface interval, placing corals, surface time, and then back down, collect more. You know, staging them under the boat and then bringing them up once the dive's over after decompression. Um, it... Yeah. So back when I was in the Marshall Islands, I, I, I did about six months in the Marshall Islands in 2010 and we were collecting fish at 150 to 200 feet. And that was like still single tank, dumb, risky take, risky collection. But um, that involved a lot more decompressing the fish and, and doing things in stages. 90 feet is not quite so bad and we can still do it on, on regular bottles. But any, I don't go any deeper than that. It's, it's just not worth the, the risk at that point. Um, we're looking to step up our deep water side of things. Um, and to sort of increase our tech level, but that's a, that's an investment. So, uh, we might've talked about this the first time I had you on, but, um, just refresh our memories in terms of when, when you're on a, uh, on a, on a you know, on a, on a mission in terms of diving, collecting corals and what have you, and you've got your, um, you know, your 40 horsepower, you know, um, power, powering your skiff. What, what's the, what's the process in terms of, are you bring, basically bringing up corals and they're sitting on the deck of that skiff out of water? until they get back to your holding facility. Yeah. Is that what's going on there? I mean, so they're yeah. really getting exposed yeah. to a lot so of elements. We're... Yeah. Uh, and we've actually, we've, we've sort of learned what the corals limits are as far as time out of water and deep water coral does not like being out of water. I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it's not about being a prima donna. It's just nothing in their life genetic experience has ever meant they had to deal with low tide. Yeah. Right. They're always, you know, if you're, if you're a coral that lives its life 45 to 80 feet, you never experience low tides. So you're just not equipped for toxins building up and not getting flushed away. You're not built up for, for warm water, warm temperature, any of that. Um, yeah. So when we're collecting near, near the station, we'll collect, put it on the boat and we have a staff member on the boat rinsing it. I don't yet have live wells and sprayers and things to keep the water with fresh seawater and cool. Um, that's in the works, but right now it's just a guy with a bucket, which is, you know, pouring cool water. We wrap it up with newspaper uh, when me and Jake went, we actually didn't prepare for how much coral we were going to be taking back. So we used seagrass. We actually went and cut turtle grass, like the, like, you know, two centimeter wide turtle grass, cut a bunch of that and use that to wrap up corals. But yeah, the biggest thing is keep it wet, keep it cool, keep it out of the sun. If we're going out for days of time, like on this trip, we're going out for, we'll stage it in the shallows. A couple days of collecting, staging it, staging it. We'll put buoys out so we know where we're, we've been staging it. So we don't spend, you know, half a morning looking for coral that we've, we've bank vaulted. Yeah. And then go back, pack up the boat first thing in the morning while the sun's not quite, you know, up in the air and then make a beeline for the station. We, we aim for an hour and a half or less time out of water. That's maximum. Wow. I mean, that, that, so I've had some of the, like some of the Australian exports told me. Yeah. Um, temperature acclimation, you know, when you um, bring those corals back to the facility, you know, I, I've heard uh, Chris Meckley, you know, talk about that. I've heard Jake talk about it, that you do not have to temperature acclimate uh, acros. Um, has that been your, your experience? No. Different. So our water temperature here is pretty consistently 79 to 81 degrees. It's warm. Um, my tanks were able to, we've, we've got enough, we've, we've sort of staged with enough sunlight. We've, we've got it where they're right at 81 degrees full, full time. And every time we've logged our temperatures, 81 degrees. So our corals are, are used to that. Um, deep water corals are cooler, right? They're, they're used to cooler water, but our surface collected corals and the, the, the tanks, we keep at 81 degrees. So where, again, deep water, we try to keep them usually out of the sunlight. We're keeping them in sunlight for long-term for, for just sugar availability, but for cooler water, we'll keep them in, um, in the middle of the, of the warehouse. It's a little bit cooler, like a degree. Cooler. I, I guess what, what I'm so, asking you, man, is, yeah. um, when you bring them back to the holding facility after collecting, uh, you know, dive or what have you, are, are you sitting there and, um, kind of acclimating them to the temperature of the holding facility? If you've got some, no. Okay. No, get them, get them in the water as fast, get them out of wrapping and into the water. So as no, fast uh, as possible. no, yeah, we've never had. Okay. Yeah, we've never had a problem from that. It's the only time we've had a like a mass die off after collection is when they were on the boat for too long. Even with pouring water over them, even with you know being as delicate as we could, it was just too long of a dive trip. We were out on the water for too long, and the, the deep water corals didn't like the the exposure. Yeah. The shallow corals didn't care, but the deep water corals protested, and we lost uh, a that lot. That makes sense. So lesson learned: never having yeah, that happen. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, Alex Correa is making a comment here. Um, this is related to the uh, to the tour that you, you you gave a while ago. Uh, Tim, real colors, real pigments is right there. Remember what Chris said, um, Meckley. Halides to grow, LEDs to show. Laugh out loud. Sun is indeed the ultimate lens yeah. for pigment fermentation. Yeah. yeah, for sure. LEDs to show. Let me. Uh, I'm gonna run and grab a thing. I, I can be off camera. For five seconds but i've got a thing to show you yeah. um <clears throat> so for a brief period of time i took a i took a year away from the uh aquarium business to work underwater cameras it was actually pace hd a 3d camera company but i did the, the underwater side of it um same company that did avatar but i i got this guy uh it's an uh, it's a diveable underwater color chart. Oh, really? And I'll take it to show that, like I'm not full of shit. Like if I if I take a photo of a coral, this is, you know, you can you can you know you can temper you can uh calibrate off of that. Yeah. Because there's so much dishonesty in in coral photography and coral, that's awesome, know, online man. coral I love that. sales. That's that's a yeah, great I, I wish more I mean it was a sixty dollar piece of plastic at a at a photography supply place, but you know, it's diveable. Like it's made, it's, it's printed on plastic. I can actually, you know, use it as like a writing tablet underwater, but, um, yeah, it, it means that it's, it, it cuts all the bullshit. Sorry. <laughs> cuts all the BS, the BS out of the, um, the, the coral sales game. Like take a photo, you know, they always say like, take a photo under white light. Take a I photo love under that dude. That is, right? that is an, that should be a standard practice for anybody that it should be standard. Sh that should be, that'll, that'll cut out a lot of the, uh, bullshit, uh, for sure. In terms of what's yep. been going on. Well, that's uh, DGK Custom Balance, DGK Color Dot Tools. If you want to, you got a website thing you want to sell. There's a, there's a, there's a thing to sell, nice. right? So. Um, John Wright. Um, yeah. So uh, his question is related to actually shipping, exporting, you know, the corals to uh, to folks to um, um, wholesalers. As Tim learned a lot about transporting corals, I re recently saw Chris Meckley with great advice on transporting different corals. What what have um, what what have you learned there, um, Tim, in terms of you know over time exporting corals, shipping in terms of the uh, trans shipping? I've I've learned a lot, and it's actually I've learned a lot, and it's actually really good to have Chris Meckley in the uh, in that in that question line because he I've, I've I've wanted to ship to him. I haven't yet shipped to Chris, and I've I've wanted to. Um, he set a pretty high high bar for me to be able to have corals be viable for 48 hours in a box. And I wasn't able to reach that to where I felt comfortable sending him corals. Um, and so I haven't followed up on it because it's, it's too warm here. And I haven't been able to simulate the temperature of an airplane cargo hold, which could be in the 50s mm, yeah. for, you know, for that. Yeah, do you use like a heat pack or um, something? So I've learned... I, I don't have access to heat packs here. I, I could import them, but it's 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 its own sort of thing. Um, more, I think it's I don't have cool. I don't have a refrigerated room. I can't get an air conditioning, you know, an air conditioned room cold enough to show it. Um, I've had corals viable for like 36 hours, but 48 hours at where I feel comfortable saying I can get you 100. percent Except I to LA, I have you know less than one percent DOAs, pretty darn consistently. But you know to Texas, to the middle of the country, or as far as, um, as far as, as the East coast, I can't say that with, uh, with enough confidence, which I hate. I've made, I've made changes. There's, you know, new styrofoam and bigger plastic bags and higher quality oxygen. There's, there's other, there's things I've learned, you know, to make that packing process better. We, we pack, uh, either you could say smaller corals to bigger bags, which from a business perspective is less profitable, but it increases our, our live arrival, uh, percentage. Um, biggest thing I've seen that I've had to change is taller styrofoam, the styrofoam I was able to get in country. And again, I'm, I'm on the edge of the third world. So supply chains of styrofoam are rough, yeah. um, but bringing in taller styrofoam, which means that there's more oxygen in that bag increases my shipping distance. So, um, I hope he, I hope uh, he's still in channel. He can hear that because he set, he, he put a good challenge, you know, like when you put a, a high bar, someone has to rise to yeah. the occasion or, or fail to. Um, he set a really good high bar for me to learn to ship better. So working on it, <laughs> working on it. Well, you know, I'm sure Chris would be motivated to get some of the, uh, the purple monster there. So, you know, yeah. 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 Um, Aqua Splendor, um, reef bum. How many species of Pacilla, Pacilla, poor, um, 
I can't pronounce the uh, scientific name. Someone's called call it Bacillopora family. Does he think he Wait. has their Stellophora? Yeah. yeah, that's um, Stellophora, um, Bacillopora, Seropora, um, M-A-D-R-A-C-I-S, Madracius? Madracius, yep. Yep, Madracius, yep. Talk to mm -hmm. us about... Uh, it might be Madracius, but yeah. So uh, that was Reese Splendor asking? Fantastic Aqua, question. Aqua, Aqua Splendor, yeah. Aqua Splendor. The, the honest answer I can give you is that I, a, a gorgeous pink Stellophora that catches my eye, like, man, that's pink, right? And I'm like, oh, yeah, no one buys that. That's what my customer's going to say. If, if I send it to my customer, they're going to be like, why the hell did you send me this? I don't want it, right? Like, I, I get scolded if I collect it and send it. And so I take a look at it, and then I move on. And unfortunately, the market doesn't want it. And it's a, it's a rad coral, right? If I knew that it would sell and it wasn't destined to sit in someone's, you know, can't sell pile and eventually turn brown and die, because I've seen mm. that, um, I would collect more of it. We would farm more of it. But it's one of those things that despite having a beautiful color, um, Pasilopora just gets left behind. Uh, other than um, the Stellophora that's um, uh, Milka Stylo. Other than Milka Stylo, again, I don't know if anybody in Milka Stylo is now considered a cheapy frag. Like, yeah. it's a gorgeous purple coral. It is an awesome coral. People aren't really that into it. Yeah, yeah. I did just collect a really cool Stylo Cosinella that was like red, like blood red the other day. So that's going to get sent and it's, it's on our sites. Um, but. I, that falls under that, like, you know, Jake corals of, of, of corals that like collectors are into and people that are into really niche market stuff. And it's a failing on my part that I can't tell you how many species we have here. Um, I'm sure the species it's, it's dense, but it's just, I, I only have so many hours underwater to, to pay the bills. And so when I'm underwater, I'm focused on what I know is going to sell, uh, cause the customers are already asking for it. So, um, you know, now that you've given me a good stumped me question, uh, I'm going to pay a lot more attention to it. So. Aqua Splendor says, dude, give me the pink stylo and the, and the posy. Uh, I've been trying for two years, uh, but he's in Canada or she's in Canada. Get your, um, so if you can do me a solid and, and let me know like who you're buying from and who your supply network is. And then I can get, you know what I mean? Like then that basically then demand forces the, the, the retailer to request it. And then the wholesaler I ship to will, will stock it. It's, it's just one of those things that like, if I send it to a wholesaler, they're not going to know that there's demand on the, on the, on the retail end because no one's asking them. It has to go up the chain for, for me to send it. Um, I think it's gorgeous coral, but you know, it, if the, if the wholesaler doesn't want it, they, they're not going to want to pay for it. And they're not going to pay the airfare for it when I send it. it to it's them. a crime because years ago I had this kick-ass pink stylo that was just this neon pink. It was vivid. And maybe that's what you're talking about that you uh, can collect there. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, like, I think that is just a freaking like, like, yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah. Like that. I, I, mm -hmm. I, you know, and I think that is just the best kind of, I mean, you know, I love bright colors. I love solid, bright colors. Mm -hmm. And that sort of color was just, you know, and you, and you can't, I mean, that's probably why Aqua Splendor is like, please send me that, um, that, uh, pink style you because you don't see it anymore. And, yep. and it's weird because you know, you don't see a lot we of can. hobbyists that have it in their tanks right now. I got really excited and I, I, I just don't have the bandwidth to be watching much YouTube, but I got really excited when I saw the 52 weeks of reefing, the most recent stuff that they're putting, or at least this season, because they were going to do a shallow water, one species of, of Cardinal fish balmy. Right. And he'd even posted that he wanted to do like, multiple frags of the same coral so they grow in together because that's what I see on the reef, right? Like you go on a reef and there'll be a massive, you know, piece of furniture or couch or even car sized head of Pasilopora, um, cylindrica finger, finger parades, uh, the yellow finger parades, right? In shallow water that dominates, right? And it's yellow. It's, it's, it's actually less green than this yellow. It's, it's like canary yellow, right? And then you have, um, what do they call them? Threadfin cardinal fish. The cardinal yeah, fish is silver. Yeah. But at the right light, it's lightning yeah, blue. So cool. That swims in and out of it. And it's you know, it's almost like a like an anemone fish. And it's gorgeous. But that's a that's another coral that if I send it, the, the suppliers are like, why did you send me this coral? It's junk. But it's canary yellow. I mean, there's no acropora that's that yellow, you know? And that next to a yellow coral like that, next to a pink coral, like some Siridopora or the cat's paw or, or possible, the, the, the yellow and the pink set each other off so well. And it's something that I see in the wild, but 
It's just there's there's no interest in then that. Then you throw a little uh, Tortiosa, blue Tortiosa in the mix there, and that is a kick-ass tank. Right. That we collected at... I would see those relatively close together. That was a little deeper, you know, not not in like splash zone, but that was like, you know, snorkeling depth, you'll see Tortuosa. Yeah. Like the the immortal tort that uh, that I collected with Jake in 15, um, that was snorkeling depth, maybe 20 feet. Yeah, shallow. Shallow. Wow. Um, Todd at Champion Lighting Supply says, and this is so true. The pinks get washed out in the Windex tanks. That's that's what's going on. A lot of people have the yep. blue uh, yep. you know, lit tanks. And that stuff is not really um, popping. So, you know, you're not seeing a lot of um, full spectrum type of lighting in, in tanks these days. And uh, yeah, that's what's happening. I think that there's just been a lot of, um, it's going to sound really crotchety of me, but like short term, short term gain, a lot of like, what's that, what's the, what's the trend on, on Instagram? And we'll target our sales to that, not long term. What's a good looking coral from 10, 15, 20 feet away. Um, I like, you know, the old guard was into white light tanks. Yeah. You know, uh, my friend in, in Los Angeles, uh, uh, Dave Botwin, he, he, white light tanks, you know, tanks that look good from 20 feet away. Tanks that like when someone walks into your house, they're like, oh, wow, that looks cool. Not a coral that you have to like get a, a, a orange lens, an oil stain from someone's forehead yeah. on your, on your, on your glass so they can see the, the <laughs> differentiations in coral pops. Like, like rainbow tenuous does not look that good from 10 feet no. away. It's kind of a bland, yeah. boring color, but, but under a macro with tons of blue light, it blows your mind. So it's, you know, what's driving demand. And right now, or at least for the last five, 10, five years, it's been frags of, of corals that look really good under blue light and Windex tanks. And maybe that'll shift, maybe that'll change. But, um, you know, now that you're seeing Fiji open up, that might change. Cause that was, you know, kind of a, a big vendor of, you know, pink style opera and yellow, uh, yellow leathers and stuff. So. Maybe maybe that that will change the trend a little what, bit. What are some other um, corals that you think don't get the respect that they deserve? That you're you know that you see and you just can't collect because you just feel like they're not going to uh, sell. One of my favorite corals that has never been popular is uh, Gold Galaxia. Comes out of Indonesia. I don't collect it here, so you're you know throwing attention towards a, a rival exporter, <laughs> right? But uh, it's a gorgeous coral. Under a macro, it looks a lot like gold torch, right? Like that, that, that like uh, what's that? Holy grail gold torch, yeah. right? It's greens and, and oranges. Yep. It's aggressive. It needs an area, but like under in, in reefs with chalice corals and other sort of like low light or lower energy, more higher nutrient corals, it, it's it's a gorgeous coral. And they're, they're strong as hell. You, they're tough to kill. It's just a cool coral. They're fraggable. It's something you can share with friends. It does need, you know, it needs a perimeter. But there's a lot of collectoritis. A lot of people want like one of every yeah. coral and they don't think of like what the environment that these corals come from and what do they complement each other best with. Um, and so I think that's one of those corals that sort of forces a perimeter around it. So like you put that coral in, it's going to define an area of your tank that nothing else is going to take your attention away from. And it's just a cool coral. So that's a coral I wish got more love. Um, it's not expensive. It's just, it's a cool one. Um, I brought up earlier sunset monopora. That was the first coral that made me like, oh man, like what would it be like? There's fields of this yeah. coral, you know, well before I'd ever gone diving, I imagined that like these super rare corals were common in the wild and, and they're not, you know, you go over a reef and there will be hundreds of like a common strain. And then one of something unusual that, that gets a name in the States. Staghorns to me too are like gorgeous corals. Uh, you know, you, you you don't see too many tanks these days with staghorns. Is that is that uh, kind of your observation too in terms yep. of? Um... I got scolded last time. I sent ten pieces, not big, you know, medium, medium, large pieces of blue staghorn. I got scolded. Why'd you send me that? No one wants that. Like it's because it's blue staghorn. It's gorgeous. That's messed up. That's I just guess. messed up. I don't get it. I don't. I don't either. I don't. I don't either. If 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 I like a coral, I mean, I've 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 been a hobbyist. I've been a you know aquarist to the stars. I've I've been an importer. I've I've I've, I've sort of worn every hat in this in this industry, and I think I know what what good coral is. And unfortunately, uh, I I made the wrong call on blue staghorn. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think here's what I like, and and, and this is just me. But, you know, maybe uh, other people, uh, you know, have similar um, thoughts. But I think there's nothing better than a mature reef tank. Staghorns, tabling, uh, tabling acros, and cupping Montipora. Oh, yeah. That, 
you know, how can you beat that combination, you know, in terms of just... I'll get... So staghorns I'll see on a back reef a little bit lower energy, and they will completely take over and make a thicket where that's the only coral there. Um, when So in the 2015 expedition with Jake, where we collected the tortuosa on, the, on, on a slope, on the flat of that reef, the low energy back end where basically the, the staghorn had taken all the wave energy away, whatever residual wave energy was left on that reef. So the medium energy was where the staghorn was. The low energy shallows, like snorkeling depth, was where we saw Purple Monster. So it went Purple Monster, a little bit deeper water, a little more energy. It was staghorn. It was mostly, God, what was it? I want to say it was green. But then we saw a couple pieces of like a, like a turquoise blue. We collected those. Unfortunately, they bleached out. And when they got to the States, even though they weren't dead, they bleached out white. And the receiving guys that weren't very well trained threw them out thinking they were mm. dead. And so those didn't, that didn't become a thing, but that, that's still a gorgeous coral. And then as we got more towards high energy, we saw more Possilpora and we saw Australogyra, which is another coral that no one cares about. It's a branching fovid. Um, so it, it's, it's a medium branchy coral, but it's, it's a fovea. It's, it's, you know, think like you get weird, like branching, um, um, Echinopora, sometimes Echinopora herida. Uh -huh. You get these sort of weird growth forms of corals that don't normally take that form, but it's a, it's a branching, uh, Fovid. Um, and so that was on that reef and that only comes from the Solomons. Um, so that was on that same reef out in, out in central. Um, but yeah, that staghorn, uh, people, for, for whatever reason, the buying public isn't there. And when I think of a mature tank, I think of the back, back of a tank with, you know, giant thickets of stag, uh, a coral, a staghorn coral that I love. Uh, I actually used to get made fun of when I was on the, on the, uh, at a wholesale company. Cause every time it came in, I was like, Ooh, Robusta. <laughs> um, I get made fun of because it's, 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 it's awesome. It's, it's this like, you know, it'll be like forearm thick branches yeah. or even, you know, five thick branches of like gorgeous green, like watermelon green into, into pink red. Um, and it's one that doesn't really sell, uh, that well. I've seen it under really high energy reefs where it almost tables out. It forms like a, like a, like a, where the, where the branches yeah. go wide yeah. and then fuse together and it had a little bit of verticality to it. Um, so it was a semi tabling. Oh, here's what I got. So the table, you said that your ideal reef is staghorn tabling and millipora. Uh, I'll see well, tabling cu and millipora. Cu on cupping the montipora. Reef. Cupping montipora. I love millies too. Oh, cupping montipora. Yeah. It's just like a cupping, cupping montipora. montipora, you know, they can get so big. And I, I had a cupping montipora that my clownfish hosted. <laughs> okay. So where it forms a tower and sort of yeah, like a scrolling, like, like scrolling it's... cupping type of thing. I think that's kind of a cool look, yep. you know? That's just yeah. me. Okay, so like Monopora, Monopora, um, uh, the common one. Yeah. Yep, Capricornus. Yep, yep. That is a gorgeous coral. So I have a I have a soft spot for Capricornus. The um, worldwide corals has their grafted strain. At the same time that they were developing their grafted strain, I was working for a company in Malibu, Doc Aquarium. I almost wear their uh, wear their tank top, but I didn't want to show off my farmer's tan today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's um that was uh kevin phoenix had, had a service company called doc aquarium out of malibu so we had all you know celebrity customers and he had a greenhouse and uh in the summer we would grow coral gangbusters in the winter we'd have to supplement the lights but in the summer we could grow coral in a greenhouse he really was his grow, grow coral in malibu under under a greenhouse and one of the customers had a red monopora with a little green freckle and i'm a freckled guy so i have an affinity for for freckles on corals and it was a little green, in, you know, green fluorescent protein infection. And so I excised that piece, took it back to the greenhouse, and then grew it so that the growth edge was on that green freckle. That green freckle turned into a green line. We excised that piece out, and eventually it started to splay out and formed like a, like a radiating graph, just like what, what, what Worldwide Corals had. And we were so proud of that coral. That was one where, we, you know, frags were 150, yeah. and it was, it was a big deal, or $200. It was, it was a big deal. This is, you know, 2010, 2011. Um, and when, uh, I think worldwide released the starburst, the grafted starburst monopora, I, I gave up cause it was like, now they have a four colored grafted monopora. I'm like, <laughs> you I, got, I, I you got your beat. I can't beat that. <laughs> yeah. I can't beat that. But, uh, but I was really proud of like developing a strain of grafted coral from a single freckle. So yeah. Yeah. Doc aquarium out of Malibu. He still, still services. Oh, so really? He's still doing well. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, dude, I, uh, I appreciate you taking all this time to, uh, to chat with us again. And, um, I know, um, I know you, uh, you're, you're a very busy guy. Probably got a lot of things, um, to, uh, to, to plan out in terms of we got dive, dive, to get to, dive yeah. trips. Well, any, um, 
Any uh, final thoughts, man, in terms of uh, what we've been talking about tonight? Anything else we, we missed, perhaps? Uh, I, what I need to do is take more photos. Um, I, I had intended to get you more media, and it just there wasn't the time, there wasn't the, 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 the camera to do it. Um, I think I need to make it a point to get like a, a GoPro out here so we can dive and, and show some cool. stuff and show. I I, cause I think there's a big disconnect between reefers and divers, right? And if, if, if we can bridge that gap, I mean, I'm here and when I'm diving, I might as well strap something to my head and, you know, sort of document what it is. And even if I, if I'm not, you know, taking uh, footage to, to show, at least we're just taking bulk footage and stuff comes out of that. Cause like the, what, what reefers are guessing at what a reef should look like. Aquarists are guessing at what a reef should look like when like coral bombies have combinations of species that we're just not seeing in tanks. And I think maybe if we can get some media out, I, I would do that. So I will make it a point to bring a GoPro in here. Nice. So I'll have media Looking for you forward. next time. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, just a couple final uh, comments from the uh, viewers, uh, Todd of Champion Lightning Supplies. Send me all your misfit corals. Um, Blue Reef, Blue Reef <laughs> you can see Tim has so much passion for coral and diving. Jason Langer, I uh, love Monty's. Yeah. Um, uh, what was uh, Oh, Paul, Great Bird of Reef. Uh, tell Tim I'll come work for free. <laughs> uh, so, Tim, man, how, if, if wholesalers are interested in, in uh, getting some of your corals, how, how do they get in touch with you? What's the best uh, process? Uh, email is sales at pmcorals.com. Um, I, I think I'm out there. I mean, I, I think we've we've sent our price list to everybody. So, yeah, I mean, we should be on everyone's radar, but uh, if we're not, sales at pmcorals.com and we'll go from there. If it's retail, we'll direct you to, uh, you know, if you're a retail customer, we've got to respect the food chain, but we'll get you to our uh, to a wholesaler and we'll line up line up boxes that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're eager to, to get stuff moved. So, uh, you know, also we're eager to expand our radius. I really was only working with, with West Coast United States, but uh, we're ready to start doing, you know, further afield. It's the, the, the key... Uh, to get back to that Meckley conversation was was styrofoam, taller boxes, more oxygen. So uh, we're ready to expand our radius. Um, Paul uh, Graybird Reef uh, just dropped your um, Instagram. Uh, you got an Instagram account, so we dropped thank the link you. in the uh, chat for yeah, that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Eric Rude. Uh, Tim, thank I would you. donate your uh, your GoPro if you are serious, <laughs> Eric Rude. Um, I'm 100. percent I, I yeah, <laughs> to be honest, yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. We'll use it. All right, man. Well, listen, Tim, thanks again for, uh, for taking the time and really appreciate it. I know everybody out there tuning in appreciate it as well. So I also want to thank my sponsors one more time, Polar Reef. Make sure to check out Polar Reef's new YouTube video that drops this Friday. The Polar Reef team gives us a behind the scene tour of Fitz Fish Ponds in New Jersey, where some of the most spectacular Japanese core are imported. The journey includes the arrival of some of Polar Reef's prized fish, including Jennifer Aniston, who won Grand Champion in Polar Reef's video last week. Make sure to subscribe to their YouTube channel at Polar Reef for video drop notifications. Champion Lighting and Supply. Uh, thanks, Todd. Uh, besides being a place for hobbyists to purchase saltwater aquarium supplies online, Champion Lighting is also a wholesale uh, distributor for many popular brands. If you own an aquarium store or an aquarium service company, contact Champion Lighting through their website at championlighting.com to set up a wholesale account and finally a ghl as i mentioned i'm all in and using the ghl products um had a lot of success using their dosers the provolux controllers the Mitra's lights the uh, cage director etc they produce high quality german engineered products also a big thank you to paul who is the moderator as well as the president of the boston reefer society please join and support your local reefing clubs they are so important to this hobby also, want to let you know that all episodes of Rapid with the Reef um, are available as podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Amazon. My next Rapid with the Reef Bum live stream will be next Tuesday, April 9th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. My guest will be um, return visit from a Adam Derrickson from Battle Corals. You can check out the full upcoming schedule of guests on ReefBum.com under the YouTube section. Until next time, be safe and be well. Later.